On the 25th of July, 2000, 100 holidaymakers boarded Air France flight 4590. It was no ordinary trip. They were traveling the world's only supersonic airliner, Concorde. At 4.42, Charles de Gaulle air traffic control cleared the flight for takeoff. Air France 4590, derrière derrière vous. vous. Vous avez de fortes flammes derrière vous. Pompier leader, euh, le Concorde, je ne connais pas ses intentions. Ninety seconds after takeoff. Air France Flight 4590 crashed. All 109 passengers and crew and four on the ground were killed. Now, 10 years on, arguments are still raging about what may have really caused the crash. The accident was not one piece of metal on the runway. It was a series of events. A lot of innocent, good people lost their lives. It should never have happened. On that day, Concorde went from being the safest aeroplane in the world to the most dangerous. Igniting debate about whether her design was fatally flawed. Don't try and tell me that there were design deficiencies in Concorde. I do not accept that. I spent 15 years flying that aeroplane and I regard it as the safest aeroplane I have ever flown. The crash was the beginning of the end for supersonic passenger flight. Concorde ended up a museum exhibit when she could still be flying today. This is the story of the most ambitious dream in aviation history and the untold story of what really destroyed it. For over 27 years, Concorde took passengers to the very edge of space, at speeds faster than a bullet. It was so advanced, very exciting, very, very beautiful, very fast. Here was the most advanced aircraft in the world. The actual shape of it and the sound of it symbolized creativity. People in the streets would look up and they'd look up with pride and they'd see this beautiful aeroplane. They would see it and they would say, we're part of it, we're proud of it, it's ours. It symbolized optimism was everything that the 20th century could have stood for. Concorde was a unique achievement in an age that believed in technology and speed. The British love affair with Concorde began in 1969, the year that man walked on the moon. Well, I was there when it was rolled out. It was a bit like a, an English cricket match. We were all waiting. And then finally, Brian Trubshaw, the pilot, appeared. And people shouted, good old Trubby, as if he was going to bat. 
Concorde was a joint venture between France and Britain. And the French had successfully flown their prototype a month earlier. Now it was Britain's turn to prove itself to the world. Some instruments had been playing up, so Trubby initially went for just a crowd-pleasing taxi run. But when they suddenly began to work, he surprised everyone and took off. I mean, the noise was unbelievable. I began vibrating because of the, the, the pressure of the engines. It was absolutely shattering experience. line of smoke came behind and I wondered whether any airline would ever accept it. It was very typically English, I thought, on that occasion. It was a glorious moment. But Trubby hadn't gone supersonic. He didn't even raise the landing gear. There was still a lot to do before Concorde could take passengers. And there was a race on. In these days of the Cold War between East and West, everyone wanted to be first with a supersonic airliner. Just two months earlier, the Russians, working around the clock, had beaten Concorde into the sky. The Western press dubbed it Konkordsky. President Kennedy called on America to develop an aircraft that could fly at twice the speed of sound. We are talking about a plane in the end of the 60s that will move ahead at a speed faster than Mach 2 to all corners of the door. Boeing answered his call with an ambitious design. It promised to outperform Concorde at Mach 3 and carry twice the number of passengers. The race was not just a matter of national pride. Stakes were high for whoever could sell the world the next generation of airliner. But the challenge was pure science fiction. At the time, only military jets went supersonic. And then for just a matter of minutes, not for a whole flight. And pilots had to wear oxygen masks and pressure suits and rely on ejector seats. The first question was what should be the shape of the wings? A normal wing ripped off in speeds approaching sound. In Britain, designers turned to a shape called the delta wing. But research in the United States had rejected the design as too unsteady. We'd heard about the Americans and their attitude towards these delta wings, that they thought they would be unstable. As you throw a paper dart, it tends to wallow occasionally, and it's not good to have an aircraft that wallows when the passengers are having their gin and tonic. Ted worked under the First World War pilot and eccentric W.E. Gray. They refined the delta design to control the air currents that made it unstable. He used a fishing rod and put the model on the end of it and, and blew the tunnel at a reasonable speed to show that it didn't even wobble in the tunnel. But in the end, that delta was the obvious thing to go to. The French, too, had been working on similar ideas for a supersonic airliner. But the enormous challenge and cost meant that neither country could get beyond oversized models. So on the 29th of November, 1962, the French and British joined forces and signed an agreement to build Concorde together. The joint venture began on a scale that would rival America's moon project, with a workforce of 200,000. But first, each side had to learn the other's language. Alors, où est-ce qu'il travaille en ce moment, Monsieur McDonald? Il travaille uh, dans les ateliers. While the engineers 